All right, let's uh, start reading <clears throat> at Titus 2. We'll just read a few verses and then I'll tell you what I'm pre preaching about. It says here, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So today I'm preaching on the topic of, of zeal, right? Being zealous of good works, as we see here in, in verse 14. And sorry if I'm talking a little bit weird. If you don't know, I accidentally bit my lip. And I bit my lip about a week ago and it's just like turned into this ugly ulcer. It's just really painful. So I'm trying to talk in a way where my lip is like a bit off to the side so it's not scratching my teeth. So that's why I'm talking a little bit weird. But the sermon today is about being zealous, right? Zealous of good works. Now God, he wants us to be a zealous people, right? Let's go to Romans 12. We'll see um, a passage here as well. It says, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honour preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Um, let's have a look at another one here. 1 Peter 4. Eight, where we see a, you know, a, a, a synonym with a zeal, right? When we see fervency. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. So God wants us to be zealous. I mean, in Titus it says here, this is why he gave himself for us. Why? That he might redeem us from all iniquity. That's one reason. Purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. God wants us to be zealous. When you think of zeal, what do you think of? You think of somebody that's passionate somebody that is you know that's committed somebody that's like a bit charismatic energetic right you've got you've got some emotion behind it you're you're passionate about what you do so when we think about the things that involve the christian life god wants us to be zealous about it right so let's go through a few things i mean think about your church attendance right you want to be zealous about church attendance you want i mean do you want this church to be successful you want it to be a great place you got to be there every week you want to be zealous about being here and be passionate about it. not just you know some people they just oh if i've got nothing else to do then i'm going to go you know and, and, and to the assembly that's not the sort of attitude god wants god wants an attitude of commitment he wants an attitude of zeal in our christian life and church attendance is one of them another one is the soul winning right some people are half in half out about soul winning oh i've got nothing else to do i'll go soul winning no no god wants us zealous about the soul winning remember it's, this is our purpose for for this church this is the reason why we're here right we're here to reach this neighborhood we're about preaching the gospel to every creature god wants us to be zealous about that and it's not just people that sometimes you know inconsistent with soul winning but it's even for those of us that are consistent because you can be consistent at soul winning you know, and I've been there too, but then you're just going through the motions, right? You're just, you're just going and, and, you know, it's familiar to you because maybe you're a bit further along in your Christian life, but you can still coast, right, in your Christian life. And I've been there too where you're just going soul winning because that's just something you do, but, and you're just going through the motions, but you don't really, you're not really striving to get better at it. You're not really striving to improve. You're not thinking like, how can I do this better? And when I preach the gospel to this person, do I even care that this person gets saved? Like, does it show in the way I'm actually trying to talk? Like, I'm trying to convince them? Or is it just, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, what's your attitude like? You know, are you just coasting even on the knowledge that you have? You know, when you go soul winning, people don't strive to learn more. You know, don't just go week after week after week talking to atheists, talking to Orthodox, talking to Muslims, and don't learn anything more about those religions. You know what I mean? Like, it's like we're, we're now we're knocking in an area with Islam, right? And you don't want to just go week after week after week knocking doors on Islam. And then you don't learn anything more about Islam. Like learn a bit about, like learn a bit about it, so that when you talk to them, you know what they mean and things like that. And I preached about that when I talked about Islam. But you know, that's why I talk about zeal. Like you're passionate about the soul winning. So when you're passionate about something, you ought to want to improve and get better at it. 
Um, but not only that, but like passionate about the follow-up too. I think this is, as a church, and even myself included, we need to improve here, where we're passionate about, you know, if, if, if somebody is willing to talk more, that we take the effort to go back and talk to them. So I've been trying to do that a bit more, especially with Muslims. I've been back with, um, with uh, Nathan, and, and Nathan knows I've been trying to follow up on people too. And we even spoke to somebody last week as well, so we have to follow up on too, because we didn't really um, get a chance to finish our conversation, and there were some other things we needed to talk about. So things like that, are you, are you zealous about it? You know, are you zealous about prayer? You know, like if you've been going to this church for a long period of time, but, you, but you've never even opened up the Google prayer sheet, there's a problem there, right? Because you're not passionate about praying for your church members. You need to know what's on that prayer list. It does change, you know, and people put their prayer requests on there. So if you've never opened up that Google spreadsheet you know i've put that link into whatsapp i've put that link into facebook if you've never i don't know who's opened it who hasn't there's no like tracking on it so you know, don't be scared but jesus knows who's opened it and who hasn't right and if you haven't opened it then you know do you really care about praying for god's people you know god cares about these people do you care about these people god wants you to be zealous in that area too even with the bible reading and in singing you know, you want to be passionate, zealous about your Bible reading, zealous about singing. And when I think about this, I think about it more in the church context where, you know, if you're asked to lead music or if you're asked to come up and read the Bible, do you do it with zeal? You know, like I, I remember going to a lot of churches in the past and even at my old church, I shared this story with Michael once, like where, you know, I, I, was, always, I was always sick and tired of like, you know, in my youth group, just people just singing with half energy and that's sort of what spurred me to just say, you know what, I'm just going to sing with energy because hopefully that'll spur and, and get people moving in the right direction, which is what happens when you're zealous with things. But it's the same with the Bible reading. You know, when you go to different churches and then somebody gets up with a Bible, I, I really hate like responsive Bible reading. That's why we don't do that here because when, when everyone has to read a passage together, it, 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 it has to be monotonous. Right, because when you read the when you read at something, so you can sing together because you're all trying to sing a tune, right? But when you read together, you can't read something dynamically and exciting and zealously when you all have to read at the same pace. That's why I don't like reading passages together. That's why I don't like responsive reading. That's why when we do Bible reading here, we we read it to the people so that the person up here can read it with passion, can read it with a bit of life, and and. You know, and it's not just, you know, just for entertainment purposes. It's also because when we, read, when we do something for God and we read something for God, we want to do it with zeal, right? Because he's worthy of us putting our full effort into doing that. So when you come up and do something for God, you need to have that in mind, that you want to be zealous in what you do, zealous in your singing, right? Zealous in your Bible reading. And it's the same with preaching, I mean, would you appreciate it if you came every week and the preaching was just dead as a doornail, there's no passion? You know, I've been to, to places where, you know, it, it just seems like they're just, like, just reading through their outline, yeah. right? And it's just, okay, like, I could have read through your outline, right? And there's, no, there's no life to it. There's no, there's no passion. There's no zeal, right? So God, God wants zeal. Let's uh, look at 2 Corinthians uh, 9. So there's different areas. You know, I mean, the Christian life is really not that, not that complicated. You know, there's only a few areas. Um, it is, it's simple, but it's not easy. And I'm saying even being zealous is not easy either. Um, look at what it says here. It says, For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, Macedonia that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. See, so if you're zealous, that rubs off on other people. When you're, when you're passionate about something and you're, you're you know, energetic and you're excited about something, it rubs off on other people. And that's what we want. Zeal is infectious. It provokes others to up their game. So the more zealous we are, the more zealous we'll be as a church, the more effect we'll have on other people, especially new believers that come. Right? Now let's go to Revelation. Revelation 14. Now, this is a passage I don't know if you're familiar with, but this is what, this is what God thinks about half-hearted Christians. This is why when I talked about being half-hearted, I don't know if you're familiar with this passage, but this is a, a message in Revelation to the church of the Laodiceans. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, 
I would thou wert cold or hot. So he's saying like, you know, I, you're not cold or hot. I would rather you cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So what is God saying here? So this is a church, they weren't cold, they weren't hot, they were lukewarm, right? And they thought that they were better than they really were, right? They were saying that they're rich and they're increased with goods. And they're, but he says, but the reality of it, you're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. But we get a sense here of what God thinks of Christians that are lukewarm. What does it mean by lukewarm? It means you're half in, half out, right? You're not really all in for Jesus, right? And he says here, I would rather you cold or hot. I'd rather you just out r rather than be lukewarm. Why? Because lukewarmness is, is a dangerous thing as a Christian, right? Why? Because you, you, you end up being a bad testimony sometimes. You end up doing things not the right way, like we talked about, just we set up in the spiritual life. It works that way as well. But what I want to point out here is what God thinks of Christians that are lukewarm. And this ought to wake us up. If, if you're a lukewarm, if you think you're a lukewarm Christian, I think everyone can judge themselves, right? If you're lukewarm in your faith, this is what God thinks. He says, so then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. What is he saying here? God is saying lukewarm Christianity. It makes him sick to his stomach. It makes him want to vomit. It makes me think of like, you know, when people eat things and, uh, you know, maybe they eat something that they've never eaten before. Like, you know, you go to, to China or something, or you go to like some foreign country. And I know, I know in, China, um, in Hong Kong, they eat this thing called congealed pig's blood. It's literally like, I don't know what it is, but I think it's just a cube of blood because I think blood just eventually settles and they just cut it into cubes and you just eat this cube of blood. And my brother said he tried it once and it just literally tastes like, you know, when you have a blood nose and you just taste the blood. It's like just eating a cube of blood. I'm just like, why would you even eat that? It's disgusting. But, you know, people like they eat things that are really gross and they get that gag reflex. So it's just like, you know, and they just can't stomach it. Or like, you know, sometimes people watch things right? And they just, it's just so repulsive to them that they almost feel like throwing up or, or they smell something, right? And it's so disgusting that you just want to get it out of your system. You just, want, you just want to vomit it up. Well, this is how God feels about lukewarm Christianity. This is what he thinks about. He, he thinks, you know, when, when your Christian faith, when it comes up to in his nostrils or he tastes a bit of your, you know, your lukewarmness, he wants to throw it up. He wants to spew it out of his mouth. That's what he thinks about lukewarm Christianity. And that's why I was sort of saying that, you know, about doing things half-heartedly, right, uh, has to do with this sermon, because you shouldn't have the attitude, like, if you, he look, if, you read a, if you read a passage like this, and you think, oh, you know, man, I'm half-hearted in my faith, you know, and God just, just, is just disgusted by it, right, because God says, here, yeah, I'm disgusted by lukewarm Christianity. Don't have the attitude where you just say, well, you know, I'll just stop, I'll just, you know, because when it says here, I would thou art cold or hot, don't just have the attitude, well, I'm just going to be cold then. Right? Just, just get out completely. I mean, that's not the point God's making here. He's just saying that if you're cold, you do less damage to the cause of Christ than a, somebody that's lukewarm, right? So he's saying here, you know, because lukewarmness is a dangerous thing, right? He wants you to be hot. He wants you to be fully in. He wants you to be committed. He wants you to be zealous. That's why the solution down at the bottom, he's saying here, hey, you need to know your state, right? He's trying to reveal to you and saying, hey, you think you're all that lukewarm Christian, but he's saying, no, 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 you don't know how you're seeing yourself, you're actually miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and he says, but if you're willing to listen, if you're willing to, you know, get counsel of God, and you're willing to change, right, then you can still be used. He says, I'm not telling you this because he hates you, he's not, God not, doesn't hate you, he's just telling you this because he says here, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And what does he want you to do? Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So he's not just saying, well, then just get out. I have no use for you. No, no. He's saying if you're lukewarm, your response should be, my lukewarmness is disgusting to God, so I ought to be zealous, right? Because obviously, if I'm cold, I'm doing nothing for God. 
So that ought to challenge us. And obviously we go through, you know, we go through cycles of being hot, cold and lukewarm. That's just normal in a Christian's life. So I'm not saying that if you've had periods of lukewarmness that therefore God's just done with you. No, I'm saying this is what should challenge us. We ought to know this is how God thinks about things so that when we're thinking about being zealous, when we're thinking about striving for the things of God, this is what we're aiming for, right? We shouldn't just be satisfied and content with just coasting through the Christian life. Don't get this idea that, oh yeah, well, I'm not like the other Christians that don't even go to church. I'm not like this. I, you know, I'm at least doing some other things. That's lukewarm Christianity. We should be striving to always uh, improve, get better, be more zealous so that God is not, you know, sickened by our, uh, our faith. Uh, let's go on, right? Um, oh, 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 I just wanted to mention a couple other things. So I already talked about how you know, being half-hearted is, is not a good thing, but how half-heartedness can be a hindrance, right? And we can look at physical examples, just about setting up and packing down, you know, cleaning up, right? If you're half-hearted about it, like I said, it can cause more work. But it's the same in the spiritual realm as well. For example, like, you know, being a bad example to new believers, right? With a church full of lukewarm Christians, it's going to be harder to get new believers over that hurdle. Whereas if we're a group of zealous Christians and then somebody joins our fold here, it's going to be a lot easier for them to just get involved. Why? Because everybody else is doing it, right? But when it's a lukewarm church, it's a lot easier for a new visitor or a new believer to just come in and not be challenged and just coast as well. So you can see how there are many different applications. These are just one of, this is just one of them where... There is a danger in being a lukewarm church, having a lukewarm Christianity. Now let's look at a couple of examples. I'll just give you two examples of uh, zeal in the Bible. And the first one we'll go to, uh, and, and I'm obviously quite familiar with these passages, but you may not be. So I go to these and, and sometimes I'm wondering like, who's really familiar with these and who, aren't, who isn't. But the first example I'll, I'll show you of just a, a zealous a Christian or a, ze a zealous believer, right? In this case, it's, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. But what zeal does, zeal makes a person do extreme things for God. Like if somebody's zealous, then they're willing to go beyond what's normal, beyond the, the regular, right? And we see some examples of here of, of zealous acts in the Bible. And the first one I'll show you here is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is when he cleanses the temple. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. So they had turned that temple, that holy building, into a marketplace, right? And God was disgusted at that. And Jesus was so angry to the point where he made a whip. I don't know if you saw that in verse 15. He went, he made a scourge of small cords. You know, was it because he couldn't buy one and he was so zealous? He's like, I'm just going to make one, right? Make a scourge of small cords. He drove them all out of the temple. So you can imagine this guy just like whipping, whipping the animals, getting them going, the mayhem that's going on. Not only that, it says he poured out the changes money. So he's overthrowing tables and other ones. He's overthrowing chairs as well. I mean, he is causing havoc. It says here, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And look at this. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So why did he, why was, you know, he was angry, yes, but why did he behave that way? Well, because he was so zealous for God's house that when he saw all the things that were in this temple, he just, he just almost went like what we would call like crazy. I mean, he's obviously not crazy. He's obviously doing things the right way. But it shows somebody that's zealous. We often think that they're doing things that are crazy. Like, how can, how can they have that boldness? How can they have that sort of zeal? Well, it's because they're so passionate about things that they do sometimes extreme things. So here he's, he's, whipping, he's whipping animals. I know he's whipping people as well. Uh, he's, he's throwing tables around. Every time I think of this passage, you know, I'm always reminded of those memes on Facebook where people say, you know, people have, have, they, they have those letters, uh, you know, WWJD, and it stands for What Would Jesus Do? 
And usually people have that sort of, what would Jesus do? It's all about being soft and being gentle. And, you know, that's a side of Jesus. But this is the side of Jesus too, where he gets really angry at things. And I remember this, th this meme on Facebook that said, when people ask, what would Jesus do? Making a whip and overthrowing tables and throwing chairs is not out of the question. <laughs> so um, I think it's, it's, really, it's, it's, um, it's really funny when people just think God is just all soft. He's just all love. No, no, because God is a God of love. Yes, he's a God of gentleness. He's a God of mercy, but he's also a God of wrath, right? So he's, he's not just a God that created heaven. He's a God that created hell as well, right? He's not just a God that is soft-spoken, but he's also a God that rebukes and chastens like we see in the Bible. Let's look at another passage because I want to show you this other one as well. Um, maybe you guys are familiar with the character Jehu, but when we think about zeal, Jehu comes to mind because Jehu is really used in the Old Testament as an example of somebody who was very zealous for the Lord. And I'm not going through his whole life story. Maybe I'll do that in another sermon because, you know, this, these passages, 2 Kings 9 and 2 Kings 10, if you haven't read them, go and read them because it's just some cra crazy, some of the things that, that uh, um, Jehu did after he was anointed king. But if you don't know the background of what's going on, basically, you know, you had Ahab, Ahab was the king that was married to Jezebel. And you remember they had that, that, that uh, thing on Mount Carmel with Elijah and the prophets. So they're like worshipping Baal, the king of Judah and the king of Israel. They're wicked and, and, and just, you know, it, it, they've just basically fully turned away from the Lord, worshipping the devil, things like that. So it's at this time when they, uh, you know, they go to battle and um, one of the kings is injured that Elisha now, so this is the prophet that was after Elijah, he sends somebody to go and anoint Jehu as king over Israel. And Jehu was basically prophesied by Elijah that Jehu would be used to basically kill all of the house of Ahab. So anyone that's descended of Ahab and his house, to basically wipe Ahab out of Israel, right? Which is this king that married this wicked queen and had everybody like worshipping Jezebel and whatnot. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to just get, get Abel? He's walking over here so basically Jehu is anointed king of Israel and basically what Elijah said prophesied previously in first Kings is that Hazael who was king of king of Syria he was basically going to use Hazael to judge um, um, Israel and wipe them out and anyone who didn't get wiped out would be wiped out by Jehu and whoever Jehu missed um, Elisha would kill uh, so this is now this fulfillment when Jehu is now anointed king and then he goes basically on this, this slaughter to, to fulfill the will of God and just to wipe out Ahab's house. He's the guy that came up to the tower. I know I'm going into the story and said I wouldn't, but this, this is interesting. He comes up to the tower and, and he was the guy that drove up to the tower, right? And, and Jezebel came out the window and he said, who's on my side? And then he got the, the eunuchs to throw Jezebel out of the window. So just some crazy things that he was doing in these two chapters. So if you haven't read them, go and read them. But this is how zealous this guy was for the Lord. And I'll just show you this, this last example of, of him. One of the things he did in 2 Kings 10. It says, when he was departed then, so he's already gone and he's, 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 and he's um, slaughtered all these other people to just clear out this wickedness, right, from the nation of Israel. He said, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of, the Rechabite, uh, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, is, is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him into the chariot. And he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. So he comes across this other guy, right? Jehonadab. Um, and brings him up into his chariot and tells him, hey, come with me because I'm going to show you how zealous I am for God. Now let's look at what he does, right? To show how zealous he was for God. And when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained under Ahab in Samaria. So now he's come to the capital city of Israel, right? Which is where he's going to reign. He's wiped out the rest of Ahab till he had destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord, which he spake to Elijah. So you've got to understand, like, 
this is a judgment from God that Jehu is coming to fulfill, right? It's not just he's just this mad, murderous man. No, God is angry with Ahab and, and all the things that have been brewing over the last many years and many decades. And he's using Jehu to, to, to bring judgment onto a, a nation that was doing things like offering their babies up to Moloch. I mean, they were doing abominable things. And, and this is why God just wants this whole nation or this, the house of Ahab wiped out. And Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. So, right, so he's, he's run into Jehonadab, right? He's saying, hey, are you with me or against me? He says, I'm with you. He says, hey, get into my chariot, come and see my zeal for the Lord. Takes him to Samaria, wipes out the rest of Ahab's house. And then he says to, to the whole nation, he says, hey, Ahab served Baal a little. Right, which he didn't, right? Because Ahab and Jezebel, they served Baal a lot. He says, But Jehu shall serve him much. Now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants and all his priests. Let none be wanting. Right? So he's saying, I want every prophet of Baal throughout all the land brought. For I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. But Jehu, look at this, did it in subtlety to the intent that he might destroy the worshippers of Baal, right? So we can read on the story that's going to happen. So what has he done? He says, hey, Ahab's, you know, you thought, he says, you thought Ahab served Baal a lot. Look how much I'm going to serve Baal. So call every prophet of Baal throughout the whole land. Make sure there's no prophet that, you know, wants to be here. Is he, you know, let's bring them here to this huge feast, this huge solemn assembly for Baal. And Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal, and they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent through all Israel, and all the worshippers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was full from one end to another. And he said unto him that was over the vestry, Bring forth vestments for all the worshippers of Baal. And he brought them forth vestments. So I think that's clothing, you know, he's. He's basically like playing the part, right? Saying, hey, we're, we're prepping up to have this huge solemn assembly for Baal. And Jehu went and Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, into the house of Baal and said unto the worshippers of Baal, search and look that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worshippers of Baal also. So not only does he search through all the land, right, to bring all these worshippers of Baal to this one place, and he's brought them there by subtlety saying, hey, you know what, we're going to have this feast. It's even bigger than anything you've seen Ahab do. But then he says, hey, make sure you search among yourself because this is only for Baal, right? It's like, you know, we don't want any real prophets of the Lord here. You know, we don't want them in on this fun. You know, make sure we get them all out. But the worshippers of Baal only. And when they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings, Jehu appointed four score men, 80 men, without and said, if any of the men whom I have brought into your hands escape, he that letteth him go, his life, shall be for the life of him. And it came to pass as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, that Jehu said to the guard and to the captains, go in and slay them. Let none come forth. And they smote them with the edge of the sword. And the guard and the captains cast them out and went to the city of the house of Baal. And they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them. And they break down the images of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a draft house unto this day. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. So you can see now why Jehu is used as an example of zeal. Like not only did he, oh, as soon as he was anointed, he just went straight ahead doing the, doing the will of God, but he actually concocted this plan to trick all the prophets of Baal to come to a solemn assembly, and then he just slaughtered them all. And in one fell swoop, the Bible says here, Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. This is what zeal does to people, right? Zeal makes people do extreme things. But then when they do these extreme things, they're also very effective for the Lord as well. But let's read on. The story, unfortunately, doesn't end there. It says here, Howbeit from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them, to wit the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. So if you don't know the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, he was appointed king over Israel. Um, and instead of making Israel follow the Lord, he basically built 
two golden calves and had them worship them. So these were a, a, a basically a thorn in Israel's side all the way through because they, a lot of the kings never got rid of these, right? They just kept worshipping these golden calves. So yes, he got Baal out of Israel, but he didn't get the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He actually continued to do it. And the Lord said unto Jehu, because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, which was basically getting rid of the house of Ahab out of Israel and, out, and Baal out, and has done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. So it's an unfortunate end. I mean, you know, once he was anointed king of Israel, he just had this ramp up, this zealous zeal for the Lord. But it didn't end well, unfortunately. Why? Because zeal, zeal is what a good leader has, right? But zeal is not all a good leader has, right? Because people get up, people get caught up following zealous leaders. And this is unfortunate because you, when, what you look for in a leader is not just zeal. You need to look for zeal and knowledge, right? The truth. Because people just get caught up following zealous people, following zealous leaders, but then get, getting dragged off into false doctrine, getting dragged off into, into a false gospel, into a false movement, or following a zealous leader, but then taking on the bad character traits, right? Because sometimes somebody's very zealous, but they don't have the right character traits, and people get caught up following this leader, just thinking, hey, they're a good leader because they're zealous, they're charismatic, they're energetic, but they don't have all the good attributes that is needed for a good leader. And it's the same with Jehu. Jehu, yes, he was very zealous. Yes, he did great things for the Lord, but he took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel, right? He, he kind of coasted a bit at the end there and didn't get rid of the bad things. He didn't continue to rid Israel of false doctrine. And then he ended up continuing the, um, the sins of Jeroboam, uh, the son of Nebat which was worshipping those two calves. So what you have to understand about zeal, zeal is good. God wants us to be zealous, but zeal is like a multiplier, right? Zeal multiplies your works, but zeal can multiply good, but it can multiply bad as well. And I won't go through all the passages for sake of time, but one example I have of zeal multiplying good is Epaphras. He is used in his example of zeal where he's praying for the people. And we know that God says in James that, you know, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So you can see if somebody's zealous in prayer, it's a multiplier of what their prayer can do. But we can see also that if somebody's doing bad and they're zealous in doing bad, that's also a bad thing. Who do you think of then? Well, the, the person I think of is, is the Apostle Paul, where he was very zealous for the Lord, right? He was very zealous for the things of God. We see here, uh, we'll just go to one passage quickly because I thought this one went really well in Galatians 1.13. He says here, For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jewish religion, how that beyond measure, right? So he's zealous, right? He's doing more than what most people do. I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous. Or was he zealous for the right things? No, of the traditions of my fathers, right? So yes, zeal is a good thing if it's accompanied with knowledge, right? That's why it says in Romans 10 that the Israelites, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, because zeal is good, but it needs to be accompanied with knowledge because it multiplies your works. If your works are bad, it's going to multiply it. If your works are good, it's going to multiply it. Unfortunately, in Paul's case, before he was saved, right? And when he was doing evil, he was zealous as well, but he persecuted the church of God. Why? Because he was zealous over tradition rather than truth. And unfortunately, that still happens in our circles where people are very zealous but they're very zealous over tradition and they end up persecuting the church of God, saved brethren and believers in Christ just because they're, they're, they're so zealous over tradition rather than the truth. Now, we want to be zealous, but we want to be zealous, obviously, with um, knowledge, right? And how do you, how do you get knowledge? Um, let's just go. I want to show you a couple of passages here. Um, well, let's get that one. Let's have a look. Uh, no, I'll go to James. Just too long. 
obviously there's different ways you can get knowledge, right? Bible reading, you know, reading your Bible, going to church, listening to sermons, you know, fellowship, you know, discussing things with, with fellow believers, uh, reading articles online. You know, I'm not against necessarily things outside of the Bible, you know, because that's what a sermon is. Sometimes we get, like I said, sometimes we get too zealous on things and people are so zealous that they just, you know, and I was at this stage too at one point in my Christian life where it's just like the Bible is just everything and only. Whereas I do agree that it's the foundation of everything we believe, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't help, you know, listening to other perspectives to get more insight on the Bible. And, you know, it's just being consistent because obviously that's what a sermon is. You know, a sermon is somebody's opinion on the Word of God and it helps. And reading an article on the internet is no different, right? It's just reading somebody's sermon. So it helps. But what's most important, what you have to, what you have to understand is, is that the Bible is the most important. It's, it's the foundation and you need to judge everything else outside of the Bible by the Bible. That's why it's important. So reading things, you know, reading up on different things, getting more knowledgeable. But, you know, it all, be, it all, it all begins with a healthy love for God, right? Because it's going to be a love for God that even makes you want to do these things to begin with. And then your zeal then multiplies that work that you do for God. So that's how you can learn things. But then how do you make sure you don't forget things? It says here in uh, James 1, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So how do you make sure when you learn things, you don't forget it? Well, you have to use it, right? You're a doer of the work. And the way you do it is that you either teach it or you preach it to somebody else. And that's why, you know, maybe some of you, um, you know, have learned a lot about a false religion. Maybe you learned a lot about Jehovah's Witnesses or you learned a lot about a certain topic like Islam, but you forgot it all. But why have you forgotten it all? Because you've forgotten it all because you don't use it. Right? Because to whom much is given, much shall be required. And you know, to him that hath shall be given more, and to him that doesn't have, right? they shall be taken away. So we need to use the knowledge that we have. Right? We need to practice the knowledge that we learn. If you listen to a sermon, you listen to preaching, and you don't put it into practice, this is what the Bible's saying here. You're just going to be a forgetful hearer rather than a doer of the work. And if we just circle right back to our first passage, we were in Titus 2.11. I can see this pattern here as well. It says here, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, right? So that we learn first, we learn this knowledge, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So you see here that we are taught how to live. We need to gain that knowledge so that we know how to live right. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. So there's that love. We, why do we love God? Because he first loved us, right? So we learn, we're taught how to live right. We know that God gave himself for us, and that love ought to spur us. And that's why it then says, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So I just thought it was interesting there that we see that sort of, um, those steps happening there, that we learn, right? We need to learn so that we can know what to do. It's love that drives us to do it. When we do it, we don't forget. And then we ought to be zealous in the things that we do. So, right, so in conclusion, just going over that again, you know, we love God because he first loved us. You know, be zealous. Be zealous so that you're not nauseating to God, right? So we don't make God sick with our Christianity. Um, but you don't want to be ignorant either because zeal can do a lot of good, right? But it can also do a lot of bad if you're zealous in the wrong things or you're zealous in the wrong areas. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord. Um, we thank you for your word. Um, thank you, Lord, for forgiving us of our sins. We're, we're not perfect, Lord. And uh, Lord, we don't want our faith to be um, um, disgusting or nauseating to you. Help us, Lord, to live a zealous life. Help us to live a life in zeal um, according to knowledge, Lord, so that we don't uh, do damage, you know, Lord. And I, and I just pray, Lord, that this message would not discourage people from doing what's right. Lord, we ought to do our best. We're not perfect. But I just pray, Lord, that this would be the frame of mind that we have, that when we do things, we would be striving to do it in, in knowledge, striving to do it out of love, and Lord, striving to do it 
in as zealous a fashion as we can. So edify us, Lord, encourage us, rebuke in us, chasten us, help us to be a living sacrifice. And um, we thank you, Lord, for your grace. Um, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.